Today on Cook's Country, Christy makes Bridget a new recipe for shashlik style beef kebabs. Jack challenges Bridget to a tasting of cumin. And Brian makes Julia the ultimate ajaruli hachapuri. That's all right here on Cook's Country. Today we're making shashlik. It's a dish originating in the Caucasus and Central Asia regions that's popular in Russia and its surrounding areas. Shashlik is similar to shish kebab. Big pieces of meat are speared onto large V-shaped skewers called shampuri, then grilled over a narrow box of coals called a mongol. Now, in mainly Muslim Dagestan, shashlik is made with lamb, but in the region of Georgia, pork is more popular. And in Azerbaijan, which is on the coast of the Caspian Sea, the dish is made with sturgeon. Of course it is. <laughs> but today, Christy's going to show us a great beef version of shashlik that we can make at home. So let's head into the kitchen. We were lucky enough to find a beautiful version of shashlik. It was from the Brighton Beach neighborhood of Brooklyn. That inspired us to go and look up recipes for shashlik. We've got Christy here, and she's going to show us a perfect, beautiful version of shashlik that we're making. The published recipes that we found all had one thing in common, a really intense, savory marinade. And it also had a lot of onion. Really? Lots of onion. Okay. Yes. So that's where we're starting. I have half a cup of coarsely chopped onion, a quarter cup of vegetable oil. I have two tablespoons of red wine vinegar. This gave us a really nice, tangy, vibrant marinade without making the meat mushy. Okay. And then some savory elements. I have four garlic cloves, a tablespoon of soy sauce, which is just gonna give us some nice umami and depth, a tablespoon of kosher salt, and also a tablespoon of sugar, which is going to give us some nice balance, but it's also going to help to get us to that really good, dark, crusty outside that we're looking for with Caramelization. this. Caramelization. Char. Now for the spices. I have a teaspoon of earthy ground cumin and half a teaspoon of ground coriander. So a little bit of a citrusy yeah. flavor. A little floral too. Mm -hmm. And half a teaspoon of black pepper. And then I think the most interesting ingredients, we could definitely taste cinnamon and get a little heat from cayenne. Interesting, cinnamon. Mm -hmm. Cinnamon. And I'm only using a quarter teaspoon of each. And then one bay leaf. Bay leaf is one of those things that if it's not there, you really miss it but you're not quite sure what it's doing. Well, it's giving you some earthy flavor, it's giving some citrus flavor, and I just took one leaf and crumbled it up. Okay. So now I'm gonna get my top on, and I'm just gonna blend this until it's nice and smooth, about 30 seconds. Okay. Hmm. You can really get those warm spices. That's you smell my kind them? of smoothie. <laughs> <laughs> that smells amazing. Now, this is the marinade, but we're also going to save two tablespoons of it and use it a little later. And I'm going to put the rest into a gallon Zipper Luck bag. So this is all ready to go. Shashlik is really a kebab, and when we make kebabs, we usually like to use steak tips because they're really, really beefy and inexpensive, and they have that kind of loose grain that mm. will just sort of suck up and provide nooks and crannies for marinades. Yes. You're feeling it, right? Uh, it's a flavor sponge. Yes. So we like to start with the actual original cut, which is flat meat. Flat meat, gotcha. Yes. So I have two pounds of flat meat. I've already prepped some. I'm gonna cut this one. If there's any kind of surface fat sure. you'd wanna get off, but this looks really good. So I'm just going to cut this into one inch pieces. All right. So that's all cut. Now I'm just gonna put this into my bag. I'll hold that Thank open you. for you. And I usually like to keep the bag in something, just in case there's spillage in the fridge. Hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Exactly. So I'm just gonna squeeze all of the air out of the bag before I seal it. And then I'll kind of squeeze the bag a little bit so that I can make sure that all of the meat gets coated in the marinade. All right, that looks good. We're ready to go in the refrigerator for at least an hour or up to two hours. All right. Bridget, not all shashlik is served with a sauce, but we did come across one version that we really liked. It was really interesting. They used the sliced onions that had been in the marinade, and they caramelized them, and then put them into a yogurt sauce. Mm, sounds great. Yeah, so that's what we're gonna do, except I'm starting with fresh onions. I have one onion that I've chopped fine, and I'm putting it into a cold skillet with a third of a cup of water, one tablespoon of vegetable oil. And I'm going to use that two tablespoons of the reserved marinade. Now we are going to caramelize them, but first we're going to cook them. So I'm gonna cover them, turn my heat to medium high. 
So it's gonna take five to seven minutes, but I will go in and stir it around every once in a while. Okay. It's been about six and a half minutes, so let's take a look. Ooh. Mmm. All the water's gone. Yeah. The onions have softened and they're actually starting to brown now. Just gonna give them a stir and I'll turn my heat down to medium because now that they've started to brown, we want them to maintain that nice, even browning, caramelization, not burning. Right. So I'm just gonna let this cook uncovered now for eight to 10 minutes until they're well browned. Bridget, it's been almost 10 minutes. Where did they go? <laughs> <laughs> it's almost onion jam at this point. Yeah, they're really broken down and caramelized. Oh, you can smell the sugars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They smell great. So this is the look that we want. I'm just gonna transfer them to my bowl, try to get all the good stuff off the bottom. Now I'm adding half a cup of plain whole milk yogurt, not Greek. It's a little too tight, a little too thick. So I'm also adding a third of a cup of chopped fresh cilantro and two teaspoons of fresh lemon juice. I'll just stir that all together. Now there is salt in there from the marinade, but I'm just gonna taste it to see if it needs anything else. Okay. Mm. Just gonna do a little bit. It is time to skewer. So I have six wooden skewers that I've soaked in water for half an hour. Make sure they don't burn on the grill right. because it's gonna be hot. So we're gonna skewer the meat right on. We're not wiping off any of the marinade. That's why it was important that it be a little more paste-like than drippy. So it'll cling to the meat, mm -hmm. got it. And we wanna pack these on really tightly so we don't have burning skewer tips. I'm gonna follow your lead. <laughs> so we have our job cut out for us. We're just gonna finish skewering the meat and then we're gonna head out to the grill. Sounds good. So I've been heating the grill with all the burners on high for about 15 minutes. So it should be nice and toasty nice in there. And hot. So we'll just clean the grill. So we'll oil the grill and then get to it. All right, so I'm leaving my burners on high and we'll pop these on. I'm gonna do this with my long tongs. Hear that sizzle? That's a good sign. It's a very good sign. Oh, you're getting some of that aroma as soon as it hits the mm -hmm. hot grill grate. It's gorgeous. Now we'll keep it closed. This whole thing is gonna go really fast. I'm gonna go in and turn these every two to three minutes so we can get a nice even char all the way around. And we wanna make sure that we hit a higher temperature than we normally do. We're looking for 135 to 145. Great. Okay, I think it's probably time. Oh, time to flip. Ooh, yes. Well, that is some pretty color there. That is a pretty color. Oh yeah, that's Woo! gorgeous. <laughs> that's what we're looking for, Bridget. I think we're ready for another turn. All right. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. So we were going to turn it three times all day. So we have one more left to do. I think we're ready. It smells ready. Oh, yes. This is really hot. So I'm gonna attempt this on the platter. Very smart. So we're looking for 135, 145. 136. Yeah. So we can take the rest of them off. Mm. The smells, almost caramelized onion mm -hmm. smell. Oh, so good, the spices. The great thing is that this is just about ready to eat. We're just gonna tend it with some foil to cover it. We wanna let it rest about five minutes, which is really just taking it inside. Bridget, we're rested, we're ready. Are you? Five long minutes, that's all <laughs> I'm gonna say. <laughs> oh, there you go. beautiful. Don't forget some sauce. Believe me, I won't. <laughs> All right. Very tender. Mm -hmm. And the char is just unbelievable. Great char on the outside. I love it. A little bit of that beautiful yogurt sauce. Mm. Flavor explosion. Mm -hmm. Really intense. I love the fresh cilantro in the sauce too. I feel like you get the tanginess from the sauce and then that fresh herb kind of hits you. Mm -hmm. And the meat's cooked perfectly. It's not chewy at all. It's right. really, really flavorful. It's so intensely meaty. Mm. I think it would be delicious without the sauce, but I'd miss the sauce too. Tangy, warm, complex, caramelized, char, beefy. I mean, it's an all-in-one. I've never had anything that tasted like this before. Me neither. There you go. You've got to make shashlik at home. And it all starts with a great marinade. 
Now use some of the mixture to marinate pieces of flat meat, then cook the rest of the mixture with onion until it's all browned. Stir the onions into yogurt to make a sauce, and then thread the beef onto skewers. Grill until it's all well charred, and then serve with that onion sauce. So from Cook's Country, the warm, spiced, and unexpected shashlik style beef kebabs. I wonder if the other side tastes as good as this first side. I, I'll I have think to find it, out. I think it merits exploration. Mm. Well, the ancient Egyptians purportedly used this for mummification process, but we use it to make tacos. It's Cumin, and Jack's here, and he's going to tell us which one we should buy. Hmm, a lead that has mummies and tacos. Right. <laughs> well, we use it in so much more than just tacos. Though. We do. It's everywhere. It is everywhere. I think this is the spice I use the most because it's used in so many cuisines. Indian cuisine, Middle Eastern cuisines, Mexican cuisine. You can use a fair amount of it as opposed to some spices where, you know, I like to think of like all spice. An eighth of a teaspoon is plenty. So these are all ground cumins that we heated in oil and then tossed with rice. A little blooming there. A little blooming, okay. you get the flavors to come forward. You're looking for earthiness, roastiness, citrus is okay. Mm -hmm. You don't want bitterness. That's not a nice note. No. We did a salad, we did a spice rub, and felt like this was actually the most representative way to taste it. In the salad, it was raw, it was in a vinaigrette, and it really didn't get all of the flavors that come out from heating. And the chicken, there's a lot else going on. This is pretty plain with the white rice. So we looked at all of these different ground cumins. The texture did vary. Some of them were a little gritty, and some of them were finer, but all of them are recommended. So did you know that instead of salt and pepper, in ancient Rome, they had salt and cumin on the dinner really? table. Cumin was the default, I think because cumin makes things more interesting without being a bully. Because a lot of other spices, honestly, it feels like you're tasting that spice. Right. As opposed to the cumin, which is a team player. Right, we're looking at you, Clove, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I still have like the same jar of cloves that I had 20 years ago, because how much of it can you possibly use? So. This is really difficult. Yeah, I'm gonna throw you a hint. If it gets really bitter, because you know you can go from earthy and roasted to bitter, that's a, a flaw. Okay. And it shouldn't really be bitter. It also should have a lot of personality. I mean, yes, it's cumin and it's relatively mild-mannered, but it shouldn't be bland. Mm -hmm. There's nothing else here except for oil and rice. It's really hard for me to pinpoint specific flavors in here. This one, I don't know if I'm looking for it, but there's a little bit of a tannic thing going on. So maybe that's the bitterness, I'm not quite sure. This one, it's amazing that there's the same amount of cumin in these. Yeah, I, I asked the same question when these samples came out and they're like, yes, Jack, we measured them very carefully. They're all exactly the same. This one is a little bit bland to me, but I'm really being picky here. This one I think has a bit of a more assertive flavor, but I'm getting texture. If I had to, like say we were on national television and I had to pick one. Yeah, I wasn't gonna tell you, yes, you're forced here <laughs> to pick something. Um, I think I would pick this one, but I would be really happy with all of them. I might have to use a little bit more of this to get a uh, more assertive flavor, so. The good news is you agree with the studio audience and the expert panel. Okay. Uh, you, you picked the winner, Simply Organic. We felt like it was the best of what were all good choices. It's delicious and it has a really nice flavor. Works salads, roasted dishes, mm -hmm. spice rubs. Balanced. Yeah, it's great. All right, and this one. McCormick. I'm sure you have lots of McCormick spices in your pantry. I have this one. You no, know, it was middle of the pack. It's fine. I mean, as I said, these are all recommended. It had a bit less personality mm -hmm. than the Simply Organic. All right, and then this one. This one had some of the, you said tannic. Mm -hmm. The expert panel said bitter notes. It wasn't bad. Again, it still ended up being recommended, but it was our least favorite among the choices. It's still totally suitable. Yeah, it's still cumin. I would still eat that chili. Yes, I'm sure you would. <laughs> well, there you go. The winner of the cumin testing was Simply Organic Ground Cumin, and it's $8.59 for a bottle. The country of Georgia, located between Turkey and Russia, is famous for its cheese breads. Now, these breads can come in a variety of styles and shapes and sizes, but the most famous one is this narrow, long, canoe-shaped bread filled with molten cheese. And today, Brian's gonna show us how easy it is to make at home. That's right, we're gonna be making ajaruli hachapuri. So I'll break it down into its elements there. Ajaruli means it's from the region of Georgia called Ajara. 
and hachapuri can be broken down to mean hacha, which is cheese curd, and puri, which means bread. That uh, makes so sense. A jar and cheese bread. <laughs> there you go. So we're going to start with the dough. And this is a simple dough that comes together in the food processor. It's about 60% hydration, and it's a really easy dough to make. So we have one and three quarter cups of all-purpose flour in the food processor, and to that we're going to add one and a half teaspoons of sugar, one teaspoon of instant yeast, and three quarters of a teaspoon of salt. That's table salt. And we're just going to process this to combine all the ingredients, about three seconds. Now, with the machine running, we're going to add our liquid. We have one half cup plus two tablespoons of cold water, and I'm going to add one tablespoon of extra virgin olive oil. This really helps to make the dough more pliable and easy to work with. So we'll turn the machine on and add this, and we're gonna wait for the dough to come together as one cohesive ball. Okay, you can see that dough came together in a matter of seconds. It takes about 30 seconds. Oh yeah, it's just like a sticky pizza dough. So we're going to turn the dough out onto the counter. And we're just gonna give it a few turns so it comes together nicely into a cohesive ball. To knead the dough by hand, you just give it a push and a quarter turn or so. And this is really just to make sure it all comes together as a cohesive ball. We're gonna knead the dough for about a minute on the counter. Then I like to just spin it on the countertop here to make a nice tight ball. And we're gonna place it into a grease bowl. We're gonna let it rise at room temperature until it's nearly doubled in size. And that takes about two hours. I visited Brighton Beach in Brooklyn, New York, and I went to several Georgian restaurants to watch them shape this bread. Oh, I bet that was fun. It was really cool, and a couple of things I learned. One is that it could be very complicated. <laughs> two, that it doesn't have to be that complicated. <laughs> so I'm gonna show you one of the simpler versions of it. We're gonna roll our dough out on a 16 by 12 inch sheet of parchment paper. That kind of acts like a, a ruler for us. We're looking for a 12 inch circle of dough. Okay. We'll flour it up. So we're gonna place the dough on our floured parchment paper. I just wanna press it out into about an eight inch circle. It's easier to start this off, kinda of eyeball the circle. I typically have a little bit of trouble rolling perfect circles, but I'm feeling like I'm gonna be lucky today. Okay, so once we've got about an eight inch circle, we're gonna go with the rolling pin, we're gonna push it out to about 12 inches. We're good. Throughout Georgia, there are many different ways to shape hachapuri, but a jar happens to be on the coast of the Black Sea, and so they make a little boat shape. So we're gonna begin by rolling in the dough by about two and a half inches, and we're gonna spin the parchment paper and roll the other half in, and we're looking for about seven inches from side to side. Great. And now we could take our end pieces here and we're gonna roll them into the center line. And then we just pinch. Okay, again, we'll do the same with the other side. And then again, we just pinch the sides. And we just wanna make sure that we have our seven by 12 inch shape still. Right, because you want enough room in the center for the cheese. Right, because we have a lot of cheese. <laughs> right, and one other benefit of rolling this out on the parchment paper is that it makes this shape easier to transfer to the baking sheet. It's a sling. Yeah. All right, so now we're just going to cover this lightly with plastic wrap. And we're gonna let it rise a second time until it's just slightly puffy, and that takes about 30 minutes. Our dough has been proofing for about 30 minutes. You can see it's nice and lightly puffed, mm -hmm. and we are ready to talk cheese. All right. So traditionally in Georgia, they'd use a combination of solguni and imaruli cheeses. Solguni is very similar to mozzarella, and it's very stretchy, and imaruli is a brined cheese, similar to feta. And since we can't get those Georgian cheeses here on a consistent basis, we are in fact gonna use mozzarella and feta. Six ounces of each of these is about a cup and a half of each. And then toss them together in this bowl. And you wanna really finely crumble the feta because we're gonna to wanna to make sure at the end that all this cheese is nice and smooth inside our little cheese boat. <laughs> so this seems like a lot of cheese for this little boat. Sure does. And that's because it definitely is a lot of cheese for this little <laughs> boat, but the boat won't sink. It's not gonna overflow? It's not gonna overflow. I mean, if a couple of little strands wow. jump ship, that's okay. <laughs> but we wanna mount it up in the center. And as this cooks, it's fill in all those crevices and come out nice and even. Okay. So we're gonna cook this for about 15 minutes in a 450 degree oven. Super hot. What we're looking for is for the cheese to start bubbling and to be browned in spots. Mm. 
Julia, let's take a look at this. Goodness. You can see the crust is nice and brown and the cheese is bubbly and beginning to brown in spots as well. So I would say this is a near perfect specimen of Adjuli Hachapoi. And all the cheese fit in the boat. None of it spilled over that's the right. edges. But that's not all. We're going to add an egg yolk and a pat of butter to this and stir mm. it in. So one egg yolk and one tablespoon of unsalted butter. Goodness, so you're basically turning the cheese into a cheese sauce. Exactly. <laughs> By adding just a little more richness. Yes. That egg yolk will cook through completely with the heat of the cheese, so it's very safe to eat. Exactly. So we're gonna stir this up with the tines of a fork. This is the best tool for the job. Mm. Start off slowly until you get that egg yolk and the butter incorporated and melted. And we're gonna just work it until those cheese curds melt in with the mozzarella. You can see there's gonna be a perfect moment when the cheese is just cool enough and the curds are just melted enough that you can really get a nice tall cheese pull. This definitely does seem like it's something you would do for company. <laughs> that was a good one. Yeah, that's... That was almost above your head. <laughs> that was nearly a record. I like to imagine in Georgia, <laughs> along the Black Sea, they have contests with the largest cheese pull. Okay, so you can see that our feta curds are nicely incorporated to the mozzarella. It is cooled down mm -hmm. enough to eat. So we're gonna transfer our cheese boat to our platter. Oh, that looks pretty. And now, the best way to eat this. I was just about to ask you that. Is with your hands. Yeah. So I like starting off with a little point. Okay. Just go in, dig deep, and pull off a nice wad of cheese. Oh, it's kind of like fondue in a way. Yeah. Only a little better. Mmm. Mm-hmm. Usually feta, when you bake it, it's a little hard, a little crumbly, a little dried out. But this is lovely. It has that silky texture. Yeah, and that's thanks to the mozzarella. It really does its job here. This has the perfect balance of flavor, a creamy texture, and that lovely warm bread. So that you don't actually ever get enough. Mm -hmm. You can just keep eating it. It's, the <laughs> snackability quotient is very high on this. Exactly. <laughs> I could see this would be fun at a party. Yes. Brian, this is incredible. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So if you want to make this classic cheese bread, start with a simple pizza dough made in the food processor and let it rise on the counter. Roll the dough out and fold into a boat shape, then fill with a mixture of feta and mozzarella and bake until browned and bubbly. Before serving, stir in an egg and a namba butter. From Cook's Country, an incredible recipe for Ajaruli Hachapuri. You can get this recipe and all the recipes from this season, along with tastings, testings, and select episodes at our website, cookscountry.com slash TV. This is definitely party food. Thanks for watching Cook's Country from America's Test Kitchen. So what'd you think? Leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or just say hi. Now you can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. Alligator. <laughs>